Flash, so let's give you a bit of background on the construction network and what we're trying to do here. And then I'll hand over to John to tell us all about this, this software and Xero and give us a good start. Okay. Um, I mean, really, the aims of the construction network are really simple. It was, it was given form to try and create a kind of community between trades guys, suppliers, and experts so they could go somewhere and basically get help. I was to put something on LinkedIn this morning where there's some networks out there who only like to deal with the good stuff and to don't deal with the bad things in life. And unfortunately, the experience on site is that there's a lot of bad things on things in life. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. So the aim was to sort of um, help the business owners to develop and grow the business and train and improve their staff. Um, help them find funding. We, we do a lot of the stuff we do is done through the CITB where we can fund distinct projects. So if you're, a, if you're an employer that's up to 99 staff, you can claim up to 10 grand off the CITB um, for kind of projects around kind of business development, management, uh, domestic development, away from the site stuff, which you can also claim from a different pot. And you can claim from the apprentices of a third pot, and there's just loads of cash around in the CITB. CITB, uh, 76,000 registered licks of business, only 22,000 of them claim any money. Uh, they've got some like 183 million pounds to spend. Um, yeah, some trades are exempt, uh, uh, can't get funding. Absolutely, yeah, but from our... <laughs> no, no, it's all they can. They can then? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. When was that change? Well, they didn't, we just registered them and they got registered. Really? Yeah, yeah. So if your client isn't registered, we can help them to get registered, but they may feel heavy. That's the other thing. Ooh. Okay. Um, so to provide access to a community of experts and kind of suppliers where we can use the buying power of the group to try and drive down some of costs. Okay. Um, and this is who we sort of deal with. We deal with people who are living in the land of, I know shit down the hill and they're living in the valley. And the valley is created, and they're com complicit in the valley, and the fact is that they have issues from main contractors coming down about snagging and timekeeping and extras and whatever. And then we've got issues with subcontractors and site operatives about not making money on the job, leaving early, claiming too too much, and just generally um, not doing what they pay for, not looking after the brand or the subcontractor. And the fact of the matter is, they may have ten contracts to 10, 10 contracts or living in ten valleys or twenty valleys or whatever because they're all the same. Okay. So how do we help there? So we help our clients to develop plans to, to help the to help the business like to grow and improve the model. We put processes in place. Some of the things we're doing is trying to take what we've got one client at the moment who's gone back on the tools and is looking to grow the business to an apprentice uh, and the model. So there's him and two two guys and we're trying to teach some of the, each of them an apprentice. So in three years they'll have five plasterers and six years they'll have ten plasterers. So we can build the business through these people on a profit, like so share, like some oil, and also not have to worry about subcontractors who will hold them to ransom. So those are some of the stuff we try and do. And it's really to help them become a more sustainable and responsible like so business. So we'll do things, we do a bit of, we're not called the quality goals for nothing, we do a bit about you and being a quality and diversity and we slide that in the back door. Because you tend to find that construction guys don't really want to know about 6% of the staff might be lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or 16% have a disability. You talk to them about that, and go, nah, 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 no, 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 that. Talk to them about getting paid for what you're doing and bringing people on board, recruiting them in the right way. It becomes a different conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, we can potentially get up to 10k of funding from the CITB for distinct projects, but we talk to them about Jane about loads of other pots that they can claim from. So we help them claim for the training, for the on site stuff. Um, it's far easier for them to get their apprentice through the CITB than when they're suspended, go to colleges, because mm -hmm. they get the money directly that way. And then they should pay it to the college, and there's a little bit of extra in there that they can show in that pot. So in like 99% of the cases, the support we give them is free. It comes at no cost to us. So in terms of what do you get as a member of the, the, the construction network, you get access to all the groups, we don't charge you for any extra for going to anything else. Um, we've got like some more planned in the north and east riding in Yorkshire. I had a meeting earlier this week about 
perhaps of one in Doncaster, um, because they're the kids. You get access to the members only area where the, all the presentations are like the videos. You can go back and watch them time and time again. You can't download them, you can only watch them. So if you're, if, if, so if you're like, so worried about your content being pitched, it can't happen. Um, we've got like, free stuff on there to help them. So we've got job forecasts and loads of stuff like that that will just help them organise the business. Uh, we've got a jobs board if they want to use it rather than to troll through LinkedIn. We can take jobs off LinkedIn and shove them on the members page and you can just have to see if you can just troll through that or I'd have to hope you might see something on LinkedIn if you have to be on there. Um, and it's I know to join, it's only for 400 quid a year. Don't charge you any extra. Come to sessions for free, you come as many as you want. Okay? Payment options are available. If you're interested in it. So what we've also got is an incentive scheme. So we'll see these in front of you. So so if you join and you bring four members in, your membership's free because it'll be a hundred quid for everybody that comes along. So um, if you want to take some of those away, that'd be great. Um, as I say, if it comes with, with your name on it or somebody says John Bird has referred me or Julie referred me or David referred me, um, we'll make give you a hundred quid. That can either be to, to charity of your choice. Or, or whatever it might be. Okay. So I'm going to hand over to John now, um, and John's going to talk to us about using software. Yeah, I yeah. am. Good to go. Yeah, good to go. Thank so, you. so does anyone know what I love? No, oh, I think it counts. No, but do you know what I do love, Julie? I love interaction. Well done. Oh, <laughs> my job. Well done. Hey. Right. So today's going to be interaction. <laughs> If anyone's silent, I'll end for the head of the chocolate bar, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, that's it. So, today we're talking. Okay, so my name's John, uh, John Moses from Sergas. Uh, we're an accountancy practice, uh, but specialists in cloud software as well as uh, numerous other things. Uh, but my bag is software. So, uh, I know we're not all business owners in the room, but a uh, question I want to start us off with um, why do we set up in business? So, has anyone got any reasons why they've set up in business? Pay the mortgage. Pay the mortgage, that's good. Okay, I like that. Any other reasons why people have set up on their own? Do the right thing. Do the right thing. What that for, for your clients? Nice, yeah. Okay, like it, yeah, good. Be your own boss. Be your own boss. That's it. We don't like working for people. I don't know. Don't think you're on camera. Couldn't possibly comment. Can't work for people. Can't work for people. Do you do the me out? And <laughs> um, some of the other common things that we get a lot is, you know, people want to have a bit more flexibility, you know, for, for the personal lives, things like that. And a lot of people, it comes down to money as well. They don't feel like in their jobs, they're earning as much as they, they could do if they were set up on their own. Um, but what we see a lot of uh, in our industry is, is people will set up on their own and the first one, two, five, ten years are really, really difficult. Um, the holidays are less because the business is too dependent, um, the money is less because you're the last one to get paid uh, and things like that. So for, for us it's all about, for the business owners, why are you doing it? What, what are your personal goals and what are your business goals? And ultimately those two things are completely interlinked. So if your personal goals are to go on four awesome holidays a year, that is linked to the time that you committed to the business and it's also linked to the money that you make in the business. Um, so I think these two things always have to be completely uh, interlinked. Uh, and one of the easy, way, the easiest ways to achieve what you're trying to get to is to systemise everything. So loads of reasons why systemisation is, is awesome. So firstly a systemised business is going to run so much more smoothly so that when something goes wrong there's a system to deal with it. Um, it's not you as the business owner that's going to have to pick up each and every problem, it's the business that knows how to cope with the problem. Um, not only this, but systemization gives your customers a much better experience because if everything's systemized in the best possible way, your customers are going to get the best possible experience. And, and for me, customer service is absolutely massively crucial to running a successful business. Um, not only this, but systemized business is exceedingly more valuable. If someone's going to come and buy your business and everything is in your head, they will pay you nothing for that business because you're not a business, you're just you. Uh, whereas if you've got a fully systemized business that can run without you, then that is going to make a, a much more saleable business. Um, so I'm a massive fan of systemization. Uh, I'm a massive fan of efficiency. Um, 
you might find that I even talk a little bit too quickly sometimes, and that's because I'm trying to be efficient all the time. Um, so everything, I love keyboard shortcuts, uh, just efficiency, any, any shortcuts where you can get to just improve speed. Um, and obviously off the back of that, automation. I love any opportunity to automate things. What's the point in a person doing it, taking the time of a person to do it, if a computer can do the work for you? Um, so that's why I love cloud accounting. So I've actually been working with cloud accounting for over seven years now. I know there's, there's still quite a lot of businesses that are resisting this change um, and probably will continue to do so. But cloud accounting now, it, it, the technology has come on so much and it is going to keep going as well. We know some of the developments that are coming and I'll, I'll tease you in a couple today. Um, but, but any business that isn't now using cloud accounting is not, not embracing the future. They are getting left behind. Uh, I, I don't really think it, it, it's optional for business anymore. It really needs to be looking into this. Um, fortunately, I say fortunately, there's something coming called Make Tax Digital on the 1st of April, which again I'll, I'll touch on later on, and that is forcing people now to consider whether cloud accounting is going to be the right, the right option for them. So I'm, I'm going to start off with um, the bookkeeping side of software, um, the, the, the data entry stuff, the stuff that everyone uh, looks at and again going back to why you're in business I'm pretty sure it wasn't to be a bookkeeper if I'm right honest. we haven't got any bookkeepers in the room thankfully so um, it, you know it, the bookkeeping side it's, it's a necessary evil it's got to be done uh, to get your information out of the back end so by using cloud accounting software you can improve your sales process from start to finish um, I believe so when I say cloud accounting software as well, I'm generally referring to the likes of Xero, QuickBooks. There's a load of other options out there, but after researching the market, Xero and QuickBooks are the two market leading products. Um, they've both got huge benefits and they are both developing at a rapid rate as well, so there's much more to come from them. So, in terms of your sales, who here gets their sales, invoices, and quotes out on time, absolutely every time, without fail? Most of the time. Most of the time, that's not every time. I'm going to guess you two have got some sort of system in place that helps you do your invoicing. Yeah. yeah. There we go. So, the second. It's called Microsoft Word. You know, <laughs> you don't talk about it. Um, so, uh, in, in terms of getting you, you, your quotes and your invoices out, the, the reason why I think cloud, cloud accounting software can really help is you can set up loads of shortcuts for producing quotes can be done in seconds as long as you've got um, all the detail behind. So you just type in a shortcut, it'll populate your quote for you, put all the detail in. Um, if there's stuff that you need to send to your clients, you can add all your attachments to the quote. So when you send out your quote, it's all in one place, it's all organised nicely, it looks really professional for the client, they can see everything in one place. You can email your quotes and invoices straight from the software, so you never have to go into your Outlook, save it, download it, attach it. It's just all there, you just press send. Um, I had um, a contact from mine recently said that they got um, a painter and decorator around to look at the house, um, and they were going to get quotes from a few different painters and decorators. The painter and decorator came in, they walked around the house, they measured it all up, they wrote it all down, they typed it all in on their iPhone, and went, there you go, there's your quote as they were walking out the door. Our client had the price for their job before the guy had even left the door. Some tradespeople, obviously no one that Grant's working with, might take days, weeks, sometimes never to get their quotes out the door. This guy had it done there and then. Steve didn't get the other two quotes off the other two painters and decorators, he just signed up with that guy there and then. He said he was paying more than he was hoping to pay, but he was happy because that quality of service was amazing. And a lot of it comes down to psychology. If, if a painter and decorator comes and can quote incredibly effectively, they're probably going to do an amazing job of painting and decorating your house. They might not, they might just not be really good at using software, but straight away the psychology is, they've done this really well, they're probably going to do everything else really well. If a builder takes a week to come back to you with a quote, and they're the best builder. They might be the best builder, but because they've let you down with that very first stage of the process with the quote, and psychologically, you're moving away. So for me, it, you know, it, it reinforces you, it's going to up your conversion rate by, by doing it effectively and professionally. Um, it, the software will also allow you to track your pipeline really easily so you can see every single quote that you've sent, whether it's been accepted, whether it's been rejected, whether the client's looked at it, uh, and that allows you to, to monitor your pipeline. And, and again, I was speaking to a couple of tradespeople recently. One of them said that they never ever chase up any quote once it's gone. They email it out and that's it. 
I'm not going to chance it. The client's got it. If they want it, they'll want it. Spoke to another another construction contact. They said I chase up everything because fifty percent of my quotes go into the spam. So I always chase up your quotes without fail. Every single quote should be should not be hounded down, but you need you need to know there is a yes or a no. If you haven't spoke to them, that's not a no. If you ring them three times and don't answer, that's still not a no. They might just be busy, you know, and, and that persistence really will pay off. So chase up everything. Um, the using the software can also really help with credit control. So uh, sometimes some people may get an invoice and they may say that they never got it, and that may be a lie. But you can't call them a liar unless you've got something like zero that tells you exactly the time and date that they read your invoice, and then you can call them a liar and you can get them to pay. Um, so I strongly recommend that. <laughs> uh, another thing that's, that's really effective with with zero and QuickBooks is for those who have a service-based industry. So um, again, it could be that they have an annual service on their boiler or something like that. Is you can set up that invoice to automatically go out every month, every year, however often you want, um, without you doing a single thing. So it, that is the ultimate automation. You never have to raise another bill. It will just automatically send itself by email to the client every time. Um, and I'll come on to that uh, in terms of getting paid later on as well. So that's sales. Um, has anyone got any other questions on sales? Chopped up bells then. No, okay, no problem. So I'll move on to uh, expenses. So again, using cloud accounting allows you to do better expenses because. So, does anyone here still have two piles of invoices or bills? The the, the pile to pay and the pile that they paid. No, it's, it's something I still see now. Um, I've got a, 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 a landscape company in mind, and, and he is a bit old school, but he has his, he has two piles. I need to pay them. I paid them. There's just no reason to do that anymore. So by by using the software. Um, you could upload all of your data into the software and just run a report that tells you exactly who you owe money to and when you owe money to them. Not only this, but you can produce reports that you can send to your bank to make all the payments. Not only that, but coming soon, QuickBooks have uh, given us a secret. So maybe I shouldn't have come on, I'll be right. um, that, that you'll be able to make your payments directly from QuickBooks. So you will tell QuickBooks, QuickBooks will tell the bank through open banking, which is just going out and then the bank will make your payment. So you'll never have to leave QuickBooks. The, the QuickBooks will just make your payment via your bank. So, you know, it, it's going to be soon just a really holistic solution. Can I just ask you something? Of course you can. So I've got clients who uh, struggle to understand how much they've actually made on a job. Okay. Because what will happen is they will quote the job, they will get the job, uh, and then they will have prints for the job. Uh, but what happens is we'll still need extras from merchants. Mm -hmm. And so I was at an event similar to this one where uh, one of the trades guys came up and said, I need to speak to you, Brian, because I believe you can help me. And I said, well, what's your problem? And he put a lodge of 50 pound notes on the table with Jesus and said, that's my problem because I don't know how much I've made on that job. So obviously this will help him to know exactly where the money's going. Yeah. Right? So 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 at the minute we're just talking about uh, sort of the the bookkeeping side of things. So in terms of making sure that you track your expenses, who you owe money to, when you owe it to them, um, and stuff like that. Um, we will come on to job costing because there's a couple of bits of software that I want to touch on. Both Zero and QuickBooks do have a facility to to, to monitor that. It all depends how much detail uh, people want to get out. There are add-on yeah. partners that will link through to zero and quickbooks so they can give even more detail. Uh, it all depends on the so it's all right. It's all right. All right. I'd like to say a welcome question. I'm just going to that. That was Just going back to the, what I just said as well in terms of managing your suppliers. Some people I know just pay their suppliers as soon as they get the bill. Don't do that. Never do that. You've got credit terms, every single one of your suppliers, use those credit terms. From a cash flow point of view, you know, your customers aren't paying you the day, they, they, you send them an invoice, so why are you paying your suppliers? It, it, it just makes your own cash flow burden that much harder. Use your payment terms. I'm not saying abuse them, but use them. If you've got 30 days, pay in 29 days. 
No reason not to. Uh, and with the system in place, you can see exactly who you are, when you are, you can even set up future data payments. Um, does, anyone, does anyone still have seven years worth of paperwork in an attic car somewhere? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do that. Right, okay. <laughs> and, and, and again, because of legacy, that, that is definitely something that will happen for a few years. But with the software that's available now, uh, HMRC are 100% happy with electronic records. There is absolutely no reason to keep paper records whatsoever. I had, a, I had an intro, uh, like, you know, an intro for my desk at home until about three weeks ago, and I thought, why have I got this? I've thrown it away, I refuse to allow paper in my personal life. As soon as something comes to the door, get snapped with an app on my phone, paper goes in the fire. I refuse to have it. Um, and it's just as easy with business. So there's apps, which I'll come on to a bit later on in a little bit more detail, that will allow you to take a picture of your receipt as soon as it comes in. Uh, it will read the receipt, take all the data off, and you can throw the receipt in the bin immediately. If you get stuff by email, you can send it on by email straight away, delete the email, they've got it in the system. Yeah. Um, Zero does that with, these, with, with your expenses, you can, you can, the receipt, you can just take a picture and stick the detail in and it's in the accounts already. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and also there's something called the files and inbox. So if you get uh, invoices from your suppliers, you can forward that email straight onto a specific zero email address that will be specific for your business. It will put the bill into your files inbox, and then when you, you click on that bill, it will allow you, it'll put the bill on one side of your screen, your, your, your detail on the right hand side of the screen, you just copy the numbers from one to the other, press save, and it'll attach it. How do you know that? And there you go, you've learned something already. I've got a client that uses something similar to that. I don't know what they call it, but it's a, they have the app. Receipt bank or data receipt bank. Yeah. I'll come on to receipt bank in a little bit more detail later on, um, but yeah, lots of options there. Um, some of our suppliers, Julie, actually even ask that their suppliers send the bills straight to that email address. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't go to your, email, your inbox for you to forward on. The, su the suppliers just send everything directly there. Ah. So you never have to deal with the email. It just goes in, goes in, you log in, and you go, yep, approve, yep, approve. No, I disagree with that one, I'm going to contest that one. Okay, oh, cool. Because I know if, if somebody else has got a zero account, you can give them the key, and then it will go straight in, mm -hmm. which, which I've done. You know, we've got a couple of um, suppliers I've got. Yep. Um, and also customers as well, because mm -hmm. then, you know, go straight to their accounts. Absolutely. So, um, but some of them don't really understand how that works, so they won't tell me the key yet. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll, we'll get there, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's going to like so the technology will keep progressing. That's one thing I haven't moved forward with, actually. I still, I've, still, I've got. Uh, you know, loads of plastic wallets full of receipts <laughs> this year. I've got because I was scanning it before where I was working, where I used to work. I used to scan all my receipts for some reason. I've not transitioned that into my business, mm. so that's the only paper bit that I've got is like eight or eight plus plastic wallets full of receipts falling mm. <coughs> out all over the place. And, and the thing is, as well, it's um, it's one of those where if you start electronically within the software and you want to find something. It's easy. You just search. You know, where's that bill from Sagaz? Search for Sagaz, it'll bring up all your Sagaz activity. And you, you can do it on your phone as well. Yeah, exactly. If you want to find one of them receipts, you've got to get all your plastic wallets out, you've got to flick through them manually, you know, so it, it, you know it's it's a no-brainer to, to embrace that cloud side of things. Um you can also manage like your expenses and your rules much more easily. So let's say for example, you pay your insurance annually. If you've put your insurance straight into the software like that, and then uh, it comes around to renewal day, you can easily just log in, see exactly what you paid last year, and go, you've tried to sneak an extra 300 quid on it. No, I'm not paying that, I'm going to shop around. Or, actually, it's, it's an extra five on last year. You might be happy with that, and you might think it's not worth dedicating the time to shop around straight and save the five. Yeah, but any of your expenses, you can see are your telephone costs going up, or they're staying the same. Things like that becomes really easy to manage your expenses. Just, just, again, you might be the prime example here, Dale. Um, does anyone ever forget to claim all other expenses, or is everyone 100% sure that they claim every single expense that they incur every single time? No, no. I think that it could be possibly common. Yeah. So, so <laughs> what, what we've found is that, um, that clients who are embracing the software are actually claiming more expenses than they would be otherwise. So this, especially stuff where you're paying for it personally, you know, you go out and park your car, you put a tenner of parking in, or you go for a coffee, or 
you know, trade setting that you pay personally. If you're a limited company and you're paying for stuff personally and you lose the receipt, yeah, let's say you spend a tenner, yeah? Firstly, you've lost that, that tenner, yeah? But, but in tax savings, you've actually lost seven pound, potentially, depending on what rates of tax you pay, you could be losing seven pounds and five pence in tax. Now that doesn't sound a lot, but that's 70%. 70% that you're losing just by losing the receipt, which soon adds up over the year. I know it's 10 quid here, it's 10 quid there, 100 quid, you're 70 quid out of pocket. It's just one of those things where why not just snap a picture, and make sure you can't forget it. It's, it's not lost then. Um, so, that's expenses. Does anyone have any questions on expenses before I move on? Are you sure? <laughs> So, let's move on to, back to banking. So, I don't know, does anyone still use um, spreadsheets or cash books? Or I'm, I'm gonna say the S word, Sage? No, no. Okay, so, so I do come across still a lot of people are still using spreadsheets. Some people are even keeping cash records of the bank statements. Some people still using Sage. And, and within those softwares, you're going through each line, line by line, going through your bank statement, typing them up or coding them up. And you know, and especially if you're doing something like Sage, where you take it off your bank statement, and you put all the transactions on, and you get to the end, and it doesn't balance. Then you've got to go back and find that transaction that you missed. You know, again, with cloud technology, there is absolutely no need to be doing that anymore. You set up direct feeds where the software will pull all the transactions from your bank straight into the software. And then you, you just then have to code it up. So there's no data entry, it's just matching stuff up. So for example, if there's sales invoices on there and a payment comes in, it will try and match that payment that's come in against the invoice that it relates to. And it, it's just guessing, but it's got pretty pretty good algorithm in place to try and get the right answers. Um, not only that, you can set up um, bank rules. So if you've got common transactions that are happening within your accounts on an ongoing basis, you can set up a rule. So every time your insurance payment comes out, set up a rule that goes into insurance. Every time your bank charges come out, bank charges. Every time your VAT goes out, VAT. Yeah. We had a, a client with a large property portfolio. We coded up 6,000 transactions in an hour. That would have took two days before. You know, so, so these softwares are, are bringing along such efficiency to really help people manage it. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see where the future of bookkeeping goes with the robots. Carrying on at this rate. <laughs> um, again, I'm not sure if it's relevant for any other room, but again, using platforms like Xero, like QuickBooks, um, they're great for managing your CIS. So, uh, subbies can be a pain. It can't manage the subbies for you, uh, but it can manage the tax. So, um, for those that don't know, CIS is where you have to take tax off of source from subcontractors. So, you have to stop their tax and then they claim it back from HMRC. Um, you have to provide them with a monthly statement. Which a lot of businesses don't do. It is a HMRC requirement that must be provided. You know, zero QuickBooks, they can do that for you. Um, you have to do monthly returns to HMRC. You know, they can produce the report so you can submit that data to HMRC. So, um, fantastic for that. Um, so, again, why are we in business? Is it to be a bookkeeper? No. No. If it's not to be a bookkeeper, embrace cloud technology. Get your bookkeeping sorted by the software because you have no reason why you should be spending any significant amount of time on doing your bookkeeping. The software can do it all. It's not expensive software. Get the software involved. I want to really quickly touch on something called making tax digital. So, as of the 1st of April 2019, HMRC are introducing new legislation which will affect VAT registered businesses that are turning over the VAT threshold. Okay? So, that... Um, means that the way that they submit the VAT returns has to be done in a certain format. Generally speaking, by using a piece of compliant software. A lot of software is compliant, it's not just zero QuickBooks. QuickBooks were the first piece of software to, to be compliant, and we at Say Guys did the very first Make Tax Digital submission in the whole of the UK. So we were the, fir the, first, the first submission with HMRC. So QuickBooks is ready, Zero is ready, Sage is ready, uh, cash flow, um, free agent, there's lots of other software packages out there. But people who are using spreadsheets really need to start 
uh, weighing other options. There's even some software providers like Taz who have said, we're not gonna bother. When it comes to the 1st of April, we won't be compliant with HMRC legislation. Therefore, from a VAT point of view, software like Taz will not be compliant and you can't use it anymore. So, uh, for anyone VAT registered, for those that aren't VAT registered uh, and turning over the threshold, making tax digital will come for you. So the proposed changes at the minute, which depend on the rollout on the 1st of April, from the 1st of April 2020, it will start affecting smaller VAT registered businesses that are under the threshold. Uh, they're potentially looking at targeting landlords that are, have rental income of more than £10,000, which is probably two properties. Um, you know, and it'll slowly filter down until it's all sole traders, all self-employed people uh, will be doing quarterly returns rather than a once a year submission. Um, so just be aware it is coming and it will require some form of technological submission. You won't be able to log on to HMRC's website to do your submissions for that from the first day. Um, for sole traders who aren't that registered, one product that's definitely worth checking out is QuickBooks Self-Employed. So if you know anyone that's a sole trader, this product is, is incredible. It's so simple. It's like QuickBooks or Zero, but just a super simple version of it. It allows you to send your invoices. It allows you to capture your receipts um, using the app. It tracks all your mileage automatically. So it'll just run in the background every single drive you do. I don't know if anyone's heard of Tinder. Um, it's swipe left for personal, swipe right for business. It's as simple as that. It, you know, it's so easy to use. It really is designed as a super simple app. It was designed as an app first, rather than QuickBooks and Zero, which was like designed as a cloud product. Designed as an app first, and it's just really easy for a sole trader. I know it's not a construction thing. I've got me as a black car driver. Yep. That would be different. To, anyone. Yeah. Any sole trader. Anyone who's operating as a sole trader that isn't that registered. Yeah. This is perfect. It, it literally, it, they've designed it in a way that links to the tax, uh, doesn't link to the tax term, but it's produced on the same categories as the tax term. So it becomes really easy. It, it will give you an estimated tax position as you go throughout the year. Yeah, so you can go, right, at the minute my tax bills are random, I've only got 500 quid saved up, right, I need to catch up on my tax bill. So it, it's a really effective, really simple tool. Yeah, still connects to the bank, uh, and again, with all the rules and stuff. So once your code's been up a couple of times, the software learns. Right, last time we said, say guys, was accountancy. I'll say accountancy next time. I'll say accountancy next time. So it just becomes quicker and quicker and quicker and starts taking care of itself. So. Uh, and you can also run reports on, on how your business is performing as well, but they are a bit more simplified. So, what we're talking about now is, is better business performance so again this is using software to help the performance of the business so um this is looking at um just how things run within the business um and what i want to look at is just some of the um add-on apps that link with the likes of zero quickbooks and how they can help further further boost your business performance so for the construction companies these are sort of three three of my favorites at the minute uh, it's Tradify, ServiceNet, and Simpro. So, so these softwares um, can do quite a bit. So coming back to what Grant was asking about earlier, these will be your job management software. So you can put in really detailed information for your quoting. Um, so you can have all of your materials from all of your suppliers within the software so that you go, right, I need X, Y, and Z, pick them up. It knows what your markup is that you're going to put on those parts knows what your labour charges is, can make a really, really detailed quote just picking up the bits that are already in the software. So it will, it will do the quoting, it will then make the job go live assuming it gets accepted. It will then manage that full job management. So um, you can book the jobs in your different uh, employee or subcontractors uh, calendars. They'll all have their own app, they'll log onto the app, they'll say, right, on Monday I'm going to that job over there for four hours, and what after four hours, I'm going to go back over here. Um, they know what parts they need, uh, they can get the photos in there, you know, Grant's talk about extras, you can get your extras uploaded in there. Um, at the end of the job, you can do all your job costing. Um, th there's another one that I've not mentioned that, uh, on there, uh, and that's purely because their zero link isn't yet live. Um, they're working on it at the minute, we've been able to see them. 
uh, and that's a company called uh, Big Change and their app's called Job Watch. Uh, so, so Job Watch also allows tracking of where all your employees are. It's got a really good CRM management system built into it as well. So, um, so if your guys are going out on site and they're due to arrive on site, when they get 15 minutes away, the, the owner or whoever's managing the, you know, the job from, from there will get a text saying, just let you know, the guys are 15 minutes away. You know, so if they're early, you know they're early. You know, if they're running late, you'll get a message to let you know they're running late. So all of that customer service stuff that we all know we should be doing, but we all never get around to doing, because we're all too busy running around trying to do all the firefighting. The software just does it for you to give that customer the amazing experience to know that you, you know, to do all the communication stuff for you. Um, so a really great system. So, so look one of those three or potentially, um, potentially a job watch. Okay, so we, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Receipt Bank. So just just to give a little bit more detail on how Receipt Bank works. So Receipt Bank is, is like what we talked about earlier with Zero, where you can take a picture and you can upload it um, into the software and it stores it. The difference with Receipt Bank is Receipt Bank will actually read your receipt. So it's got something called optical recognition technology. I'm going to be honest, I don't really understand it. Uh, I just know it works. Um, so what it'll do is it'll look at your receipt, it'll try and pull out who it's from, it'll try and pull out what it was for, put the description on, it'll pull out the amount, it'll pull out the VAT treatment, it'll pull out the date. So you aren't actually entering any information into the software, you're just taking a picture of the receipt and the software will then act as a middleman and do that typing bit for you and push that through to zero or quick book. So it's a really, really effective piece of software, especially if you've got a lot of paperwork, you just Take a picture of it all and get rid of it. If you one of those people that haven't got the time to sell off your paperwork, it's perfect. That also links with something called Trip Catcher, which is, is, is your mileage tracking. Um, and uh, you can also use it to do expense claims, both Trip Catcher and Receipt Bank. So again, if it's stuff that you've paid for personally, that the business owes you back, you can still use Receipt Bank for that, or if it's stuff that you've paid for on your business card, that's great as well. And HubDoc, again, is, is another sort of data capture uh, similar to Receipt Bank's slightly different functionality, uh, but quite quite similar uh, to some type of bank stuff as well. Something a lot of businesses struggle with is getting paid. Um, so if we can find a way to get paid faster, I love that. One of my favourite bits of software that links with Zero is GoCard. Oh, you said that's brilliant. It's absolutely awesome. I really, really love it. It will automate the full process so you especially if you've got a service-based business, you automatically invoice your customer every month, yeah? And Xero will do that, QuickBooks will do that, they will automatically send out the invoices for you. Go Carlos will look at Xero, look at QuickBooks, see what app is outstanding and when it's due, it will go and automatically collect that money from their bank, put it into your bank, then it will tell Xero or QuickBooks that it's collected that money, it will take off its small charges, which are 1% capped at two pounds, yeah? And, and then it will tell you that you've paid, count all the charges in, in your books and, and the money's in your bank. For the time it will save, it is worth the two pound a collection. It is, it is, it gets you paid on time, every time, without qualms. I would argue that more people should be using direct debit. People, are, business owners are terrified of introducing direct debit to the business and there is no reason why. Because if someone is refusing to pay you on direct debit, what they're basically saying is they're refusing to pay you on your payment terms. Because if we're going to pay you on your payment terms, why wouldn't they sign up for a direct debit? They're protected by the direct debit guarantee, so if you take money that you're not due, they can just get, get it back again from the bank. So I, I would massively encourage any business to get GoCardless in place. If you really can, which you can, but if you really, really can, uh, Stripe's a great payment service. Uh, there's lots of great card payment services, but Stripe, Stripe's quite popular, uh, really good integration with Xero and Quick, QuickBooks. Just means gives your customer a really easy portal to pay by card. You know, just, just makes it that bit easier than logging on to their internet banking and transferring it over. Yeah, there's a small charge, but sometimes it's, it's worth it just to get the money in your bank a bit quicker. Um, and iZettle's like a, a portable handheld thing that you can take around with you, um, if you if you're on site and you want to get card payments uh, on site. iZettle's great for that, but again, there's lots of other apps, but if you're doing stuff on site, you're going out, you know, you're hosting a network event, whatever, and you just want something there that people can pay on the card, either or other options are great for them. Do you have any 
just could back that real card 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 list. Of course, yeah. Um, is that, you know, is that a monthly direct debit, so could it be quarterly, annual, whatever? The matter. Yeah. Whatever you want. You could, I've, got, I've got clients that do it annually, quarterly, and annually. Yeah. And they all sign up to that. And then you set up your invoices in, in uh, uh, I, because I use zero, so set it up in zero to do repeat invoices. As soon yeah. as the invoice is issued, it gets picked up and go cardless. Okay. Um, and then it just takes that payment because they've signed up. But you can even do ad hoc invoices. So let's say, for example, yeah. like Nicole, you'll be able to do a one-off project and it's yeah. an extra bag of liquid there for that yeah. one project. It, it will just that. add that onto the payment run and it will just know whenever there's an invoice outstanding, if there's a direct debit mandate in place, yeah. we are entitled to collect it. Right. It's one of those things as well, you know, direct debit is now so common in everything that we do. You know, there's no reason not to. So, you know, you do, when O2 comes after your phone, you don't question them. You don't go, no, I'm not paying you O2 by direct debit, I'll pay you manually each month. You just accept it. You know, the likes of the, the, the energy companies, British Gas, Eon, they give you a discount for paying by direct debit. No, they don't. They charge you if you don't pay by direct, by yeah. direct, direct debit. That's what they do. You know, so if you need to dress it up in a certain way to your clients, Offer them a discount by paying by direct debit. Just put your prices up before them. Yeah. Um, credit control. So again, even despite all the stuff we've just talked about, there will always be credit control issues. I'm aware of that. Um, it's just the nature of the world at the minute, unfortunately. So I really, really love Chaser, Data Daddy. I, I don't know a lot about it, but I put it on there just so there's alternative options. But, Chaser is, is, is your credit control in-house person, but it's not a person. It's a robot, but it's a robot that doesn't look like a robot. So Chaser will operate and you can set up a really customized credit control facility that it will say, right, one day before it's due, I'm going to send them a reminder saying, don't forget your invoice is due tomorrow. One day after you can say, you must have forgotten the invoice was due yesterday. I'm sure it's an oversight, but get it paid. Three days later, you can say, right, you know, it's starting to mess about now. And you can completely customise that, and you can even have different treatments for different customers if you've got something you really, really like, and you don't want to upset them by sending them a, a, aggressive or whatever tactic you can use for your, for your credit control. You can customise that. What you can even do that I really love about Chaser is you can send a thank you for paying. Mm -hmm. Yeah? And the reason I love that is because after a customer's paid, you can say, thank you for paying. We've really loved working with you. Here's a link to our Google page or whatever. Can you please just leave us a review? So not only does it work as a, as a cash flow improvement tool, but then you can then use it for your sales and marketing as well. Do you know how much that is a Off the top of my head, I don't know the costings, but it is not a lot. But yeah, it's a, no, I can't um, But again, you know, I'll tell you what it's cheaper than. It's cheaper than hiring a credit controller. Yeah. And, and, and like I say, even though it's automated, it's very good at not looking automated. It's going to send it at like different times. Um, you know, Chaser will recommend the best days and times to chase. So apparently Thursday at 2 o'clock is a really good time to get paid. Statistics say that's true. I don't know if it's true, but statistics say it's true. <laughs> so chase your debts at 2 o'clock on a Thursday. You're more likely to get paid, as bizarre as it sounds. Um, but again, the really good team at Chaser, really supportive. CRM, so I'm not going to spend too long on CRM today because I think CRM probably deserves its own uh, individual uh, presentation. Uh, CRM is massive. Um, I think there's way too many businesses that don't have good CRM in place. And like I said, customer, customer management is crucial. You know, We're in business because our customers pay us money. Looking after those customers is really important. I think customer service is really important because I like helping people, but you know, ultimately the money is the most important bit of our business. Um, so Capsule is great, um, I use Capsule uh, in-house, Insight is a good one. If you want a really, really, really good one and they've got a good budget behind you, there's something called Infusionsoft. Infusionsoft is the best CRM that I have ever come across in my entire life. But it is a lot of money. It is probably one of the most expensive CRMs that you can buy off the shelf. And you can't really buy it off the shelf either, you have to really customise it once you've got it. But it is unbelievable. Um, I suppose really, you know, it, it, a lot of them will integrate as well. So, you know, using something like Infusionsoft or, or Capsule, there's ways you can feed it all through. 
you know, potentially you can even look at getting uh, a company who builds CRMs, you know, you know, we work with a few companies who build bespoke CRM systems that then feed through into Xero or QuickBooks. Um, because Xero and QuickBooks have open APIs, that means that stuff can integrate with them really easily. Um, so so I, I, I strongly recommend uh, having a look at implementing strong CRM. Um, so again, just because uh, cash flow is obviously a, a, a big issue, I just want to talk about a couple of quick finance options. You know, uh, the clues in the name is quick, which means it's not cheap. You know, these finance companies aren't cheap finance, but they are quick finance. If you need something quickly, they can have it pretty quickly now. Um, yeah, I think IOWACA can approve it in the, in, the, in the case of a couple of hours. They can, they can have some money available for you. Satago is very similar. What will be coming in the future? QuickBooks will be providing finance. So QuickBooks will have access to all of your accounts. They will be able to see exactly how your business is performing. They will know exactly how risky, how risky your business is to lend to and they can have the money in your bank within an hour, two hours. Because they can see your business performance, they can see what you've got on your ledger, they can see how much you owe in, how much you owe out, they can see how your business perform. they're happy to, to, to lend based on that. So just some of the exciting stuff that's coming around the corner. Um, and then I really quickly wanted to touch on, on Zapier. So I've talked about lots of integrations already and, and the things that I've talked about have direct integrations with Zero QuickBooks. Zapier is is your middle platform, so there's lots of things that don't have direct integrations with Xero or QuickBooks. Zapier can be that middleman. Um, again, you would have to have some understanding of, 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 of how it works and what you want it to do, but Zapier allows lots of pieces of the software to connect together. So, um, again, a, a, an option if you've already got existing systems in place. So, I'll ask you again, why are we in business? Is make it money. To, to make money? Okay. So, so is it to spend ages chasing you guys to find out where they're at? You know, are they supposed to be on site? How much money have I made on this job? I can't figure it out. Looking at spreadsheets. You know, is it to spend loads of time faffing about trying to get paid? Uh, is it about trying to figure out, you know, where your customers are at, keeping in touch with them? Obviously, we want to keep in touch with them by having a system, you know. We don't want to be spending loads of time on these things. There's software out there that can make it all really easy. You know, these softwares, they're all, you know, comparatively low cost softwares. Um, and arguably they'll pay for themselves tenfold if you use them to, to the river um, They also allow for scalability. You know, if you've got good systems like this in place, you can add an extra employee, teach them how to use the systems, happy days, add another employee, add another employee. If it's all still in your head, Every time you add another employee, you just add in another headache. So, better reporting. So, with systems like Xero and QuickBooks, the reporting that you get out of it can be really good, really powerful. Obviously, information out is only as good as data in, um, but like I say, with all the automation, we should be getting really good data in because it should be nice and consistent. Um, Obviously, you do want to get it set up how you need it to look at the start. As long as you do that, you can get some really good information. So, um, really easily with zero quick but you can see at a, at a click of a button exactly who owes you what, when they owe it, and, and how much it is. Not only that, but you can send a statement to every single one of those customers with three clicks. So, yes, you can absolutely use something like Chaser, um, you know, to do your credit control. If you want to do it yourself, it, it's a case of three clicks. Now you've still got to stay on top of that manually yourself if you're going to do that. So, you, you know, you've got to wait up whether you drive out the software, look after it, or whatever you want to. But it's just really easy to do. Um, like, like I said earlier, you can see exactly who you owe, how much you owe them, and when you owe it. And like I said, at, at some point in the near future, when open banking links really well with QuickBooks, you'll be able to push those payments straight from your software. Um, Far too many business owners don't regularly look at the profit and loss. Way too many. And, and it's absolutely fundamental. Um, like Julie said, we're in business to make money. If you're not looking at your profit and loss, how can you have it even know if you're making money? You know, you could be taking on more and more prop work, but that work could be unprofitable work. But if it's unprofitable, you don't want it. It's only putting you into a worse position. Sometimes saying yes is the worst thing you could do. So the profit and loss within within you know systems like Zero and QuickBooks and, and other systems of course, 
you know, you can look at how you're doing month on month on month. Is my income, you know, going up, staying the same? Is it going down? You know, what about the costs of doing those jobs? Are they going up or are they going down? You know, what about my overheads? You can have a look at what your fixed overheads. You know, you know this much money is going to come out of my bank every single month. But I'm not making enough to cover that. Um, Zero and QuickBooks also allow sort of quite unique tracking. So, um, for example, in, in, in construction, you might want to see how much of my work is residential, how much of my work is commercial. And you can really easily split that down so you can track exactly how much of each you're doing. You can even track the profitability of each of them. You might say residential is loads better, but we don't get as much of it. Commercial is not as profitable, but we get a lot more of it. You know, and, and you can gradually say, well, let's try and make that move towards more of a residential market because it becomes much more profitable for us, or whatever it might be. Um, with this level of reporting as well, you can estimate what your corporation tax is going to be. So rather than, I, I spoke to um, uh, someone I know uh, that we've got due to go meet, and they said that their accountant gave them their tax bill, which wasn't small, on the day the tax bill was due. It was a complete out of the blue, had no idea it was going to be as much money as it was. Out of the blue, this was made to find this money to pay this tax bill on that day. We had uh, a meeting with one of our clients two weeks after the year ends. This is eight and a half months before it was due. Told them what the corporation tax figure was. They said, yeah, we know. We've been talking about it all year, throughout the year. Yeah, this software can give you those estimations as you go along. So it's never a surprise. You know what it is. Um, it's the same way like you can link that to your personal tax bills with the dividend tax now. You can see how much you take and you can make estimation. You know, you, you're there. I've got a client who checks his VAT bill every single day. Logs onto his, his zero and goes, right, what's my VAT now? Every single day he looks at it. So his VAT bill is never a surprise, ever. Um, you can have a look at which customers are most profitable. So you can run reports on your customers to see who's spending the most money with us. You know, they're spending loads with us. You know, are they a good customer or are they, are they paying? We want rid of them. Are they spending enough money? All right, we'll put up to them. Yeah. Well, this person's paying. They're spending not all of us. Let's get rid of them. Can have a look at your suppliers. You know, who are you spending most? Which suppliers are you spending most money with? If you're spending lots of money with a supplier, can you go back to them and go, look, this is how much we're spending with you. Can we negotiate a discount? You know, we're, we're buying lots. You know, we're committing this much. If not, you know, we'll go to another supplier and say, this is how much we're spending with our current supplier. Could you do it at a better rate? Yeah, so you've got all that information really easily accessible. So, got better reporting. How can we now use those reports to help improve business financial performance? One effective strategy that, that I really like, uh, that, I, that our clients find really effective is rather than starting at the beginning start at the end yeah what do you need the business to do to live the life you want to do we talked about personal goals and business goals earlier ultimately people who run a business have an end goal and you've got to start with the end goal so if you know that you need 40 grand a year to do whatever it is that you need to do that means you need 50 grand before your corporation tax yeah so you're working back up so then if, if it's 50 grand before your corporation tax, let's add the overheads back on. Well, the overheads might be 50 grand. Right, well, we need 100 grand before our overheads come off. So we know we need 100 grand gross profit, which our income minus our cost of sales. Then if you know what your margin is, you can then get that back up to what your turnover figure needs to be. And it might be your turnover figure's 240 grand a year. And if you turn over 240 grand a year, that will result in 40, the 40 grand in your personal bank, yeah? 240 grand a year is 20 grand a month. It's five grand a week. Suddenly you've got a really clear focus on what the business needs to be delivering on a week by week basis for you to be able to go on that holiday. And when you link that financial performance to that personal thing that is emotive, you've got that much clearer focus, you're much more likely to achieve it than if you think, I just really want to do well this year. Because it just won't happen, there's no clarity, there's no vision, it's too big of a goal. You'll get six months through the year and you'll realize you're 50% behind. It's too hard to catch up. So for me, it's always best to start at the end and work back up, work out what your business needs to look like, and then, and then it's a really clear gap. If you know you need to be turning over 20 grand a month and you're turning over 15, what can we do to plug that gap? Is it more customers that we need? 
are actually are we, are we sort of at max capacity? If we're at max capacity. What else can we do? You know, can we look at working with our existing customers more? You know, can we can we help them with some additional services or? Um, are they paying the right price point? You know, we've got some customers using up our capacity that are paying us a really low fee for the work that we're doing. Is it worth getting rid of one of those and bringing a, a, a good customer who appreciates the value that you offer? It's going to pay a premium price for that. There's lots of things that you, you can look at, but until you know what you're trying to achieve, you, you, you don't know where you're starting from. So, so that's really important. Um, but like I said, you know, you can link these to key performance indicators. So. If it is more customers that you need, well, how many meetings do you need to have to win a customer? If you're converting one in four, you need to have four meetings. And what's your average customer? If your average customer is two and a half, and you need five grand a week, you need two of those a week. That means you need to meet eight at a conversion rate of 25 to get two. So suddenly you've got a really clear, precise target of what you need to be doing in terms of your activity to get you back to that 40 grand, that holiday. If I have eight meetings a week, I will get a nice holiday. Really precise focus. Um, just want to give you a, 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 a fact that I was, that I was given um, that the most successful business owners, studies being done, speaking to the likes, you know, we're talking Richard Branson, Alan Sugar, you know, successful entrepreneurs. They all say that they regularly sit down with a numerate outsider. So that's someone that does work in the business, that understands numbers, and they do that regularly. And that helps them hold their accountability to what we've just been talking about. Are you having eight meetings a week? You know, are you reaching five grand in sales a week? And, and you know, I think we'd all be uh, happy if we're a little bit more like Richard Branson or Alan Shubber, I, I, I certainly would. You know, so if, if, if people as successful as that are regularly doing that, I think all people should be. You know, we might not be able to, to afford Alan Sugar's advisor, um, but, but someone's better than no one. So, you know, find a new outsider that you trust, that you can throw some ideas around with um, and use them to tell you how to boost your business. Okay, so I um, actually just want to do a really quick example um, of some of the profit improvement work that we do, and then I'm going to jump into a piece of software that we've been uh, working with some developers on. So. Profit improvement is a really interesting thing for me. I think um, you know it's, it's one of the most valuable services that we offer. I think obviously tax, no one likes paying tax. But a set of accounts isn't something that most business owners want. They just have to do it. Whereas this stuff, our clients really value it when we work with these projects. So I've talked about some of these things already. We've got inquiries, we've got conversion, we've got customers, average spend numbers. But all these things dictate the profit, all these things on this, on this uh, list here. But we can only affect certain things within this process. Um, I'm just going to give some numbers as well. So if you were to get a thousand inquiries a month and your conversion rate was 10%, you would have a hundred customers. Sorry, let's go for a year. You'd have a hundred customers a year. If they each spent two thousand pounds a year with you and spent, and spent it once a year, your turnover would be two hundred thousand. Your margins are fifteen percent. That's your net margin. You'd have a profit of thirty grand at the end of that. Now, there's certain numbers in here. The number of customers you have, you can't uh, do anything directly to increase the number of customers. You can't do anything directly to increase your turnover, and you can't do anything directly to increase your, prof uh, your, your profit figure. But you can work on the others. So you can increase your inquiries by doing some more activity on social media or employing a marketing company or all sorts of other uh, you know, options. You can increase your conversion rate by making sure that your process was that much more streamlined and slick and you demonstrate value that much more effectively than your competition, that actually you become a really easy, obvious choice. Like the, the paint and decorator we talked about earlier. So slick, so smooth, happy days, you know, what a great conversion that was. If you increase both of those, that will naturally increase the number of customers you have. The average spend a customer spends with you. It is uh, so much easier to get more money out of existing customers than it is to go and find a new customer. Yeah, They're already happy to buy off you, as long as you deliver a good service. If you can um, you know, add some more value, they're going to be really happy to pay for that because you've already shown them what you can do, you've already done a great job for them. 
make sure you do everything. You know, I would recommend that you have a window of opportunities chat for every single one of your clients. These are the services I offer. These are the customers I have. This is what I do for them. And find the gaps. Because there'll be certain things that you can do for existing customers that you're not currently doing. And they might even not, they might not even know that you deliver it. And they're just assuming that, that, you know, that they're already doing everything and they might not know about the gaps. And I've heard of examples or seen examples of people that have come over to, to us to be their accountant because they say, oh, my accountant doesn't offer any of this. I bet they do. I bet they'd be happy to have all that stuff, but it's never been talked about, it's never been communicated. And because it's never been talked about, never been communicated, they don't even realise that they could spend more money with their accountant to get more stuff. So they've gone elsewhere. So not only has the accountant not made the most money out of that client that they could have done, they've also lost them as a client to their competition. Yeah? Um, number of spends a year. I mean, again, this is obviously different for different businesses, but uh, one of my favourite examples is a hairdresser. Some hairdressers are really, really good. They'll cut your hair, sorry, Grant. Some hairdressers. <laughs> <laughs> um, they'll cut your hair, and once they've cut your hair, they'll say, shall we book you in for a next appointment in six weeks' time? And they'll book you in in six weeks' time. Me, I go, no, no, you're all right, I'll sort it at the time. And you know what? I get my hair cut every 10 weeks. Probably should be every six weeks. Gets a bit long, um, you know. So not only am I getting a better customer service in that sense, because I, I don't look so shaggy towards the end of that 10 week period, but they're getting me in every six weeks instead of every 10 weeks. They're getting that much more money out of me every single year because they are providing a better customer service and making sure that I go in more regularly. Um, you know, but there's lot, lots of opportunities with that one. And then your margins, I mean, there's lots you can do with your margins, you know, um, in terms of cutting your costs, putting your prices up, lots of things there. Um, again, that, that just requires a bit of analysis, understanding where your costs are going, things like that. So, I think if, if, if people get real clarity and focus, if the businesses really focus on these numbers, it can be really easy to increase them by small, small bits. Yeah? So if we worked on a 10% increase, if we could increase the number of inquiries we've got by 10%, we could increase the, our conversion rate by 10%. And when I say by 10%, I mean going from 10 to 11. I think that would be quite achievable just by thinking a bit more carefully about what it is you do. Again, another great example I had um, was a, a roofing, roofing contractor. They would go up, they would film the roof, they would show you exactly what it looked like, they would come down, they would show you the film that they just took. At the end of that film, they would then just show you a really quick testimonial for another client that they'd done some roofing work for. Well, that's amazing. Of course, I'd love to work with you. You know, you're much better than that bloke that turned up in scruffy clothes. Your man's all nice, theirs was all muddy. You're, you look smart. They were all covered in paint and dust, and they were swearing, and you, you're being really like, you know, there's lots of things you can do to differentiate yourself from the competition. I don't think getting it from 10 to 11 would be hard, if, if 10% of your conversion rate, obviously. Getting that average spend up, again, as long as you think about what you're doing for your clients, spotting those windows of opportunity, you know, all sorts of things, getting out by 10% in the hours, number of spends, again, can be worked on. I think if you worked on all of them, 10% is unachievable. If we did improve more by 10%, inquiries go to 1,100 and conversion rate goes to 11%. But our customers have gone to 121, which is a 21% increase. So by doing one thing 10% better and another thing 10% better, we've got 21% more customers as a result. If we can increase the average spend by 10 and the amount of times they spend by 10, that actually brings our turnover now to 292,000, which is around 41%. Yeah? So by doing four things differently, four things a little bit differently, it's now accumulated to a 41% difference. And the margins, that now gets us to 48. So we've gone from a profit of 30,000 to 48,000. I haven't got my calculator. That is well over 50% increase, 60, 60 odd percent increase. So by doing five things 10% better, we're not 10% better, we're 60 odd percent better. Yeah? And they all just the cumulative effect of lots of small things all having that cumulative effect. Like when you, you invest your money, it, 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 if you leave it in, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and much more exponential. So, that's just flavour, that's, uh, and th these numbers work with anything. Don't matter what numbers you put in, they'll have the same result. You know, don't matter what your business looks like, that results the same. Small gains. And again, it might not be, it might be that your inquiries, you're already doing loads of marketing, you can't get 10% out of your inquiries. But you might be able to improve your conversion rate by 20% to 12. Yeah? So it's about, for me, 
pick the ones that are going to be most effective most quickly. What could you look at where you're at now and say, what could I do in my business that would have the biggest effect and do that first and then work on that? We actually, when I worked in sales, we had something called the ladder of engagement. And it was where you, it was where you saw yourself interacting with the client. So whether you were just a, a sales professional or whether you were the business partner and it gave you hints and tips as to what actually indicated where you were. So you could help yourself to kind of move up the line of engagement as long as the client was happy for you to mm -hmm. do it. And, and, and that, that kind of worked really well for our sales guys. The other thing is I've done with a couple of clients, especially for private, like say, domestic, where they tend to go and they'll put up a sign out and stuff. I've said to them, what you do is you get your guys while they're hanging around to go over the road, do six houses that way, do six houses that way, dropping off leaflets so that we'll bring yeah. the people past you. And it's amazing. One client actually has this incentive for guys. And on the back of the leaflet, the to the guy has to put his, his, his initials. Mr. Ferrells gets a meal for two at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. uh, and so oh, it's a really incentive for the guys to do it, just to go six houses, six houses. But they do more because they're going through flyers that are eight months because the guys are just going in and doing it. So it's just simple stuff like yeah. you need to cost you a lot. I think sometimes you're absolutely right, just, just being a little bit creative. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You can get some really great results. So. That's it, simple stuff that works. Um, so what I want to talk about now is, is Pulse. Now, um, Pulse is um, some software that say guys have got. We've been working with software developers uh, on this piece of software for us. Um, so you might not be able to go and get it yourself, but uh, I just want to show you a flavour of what it does. Um, not everything can be done. Uh, it, you know, you, you can look at doing some of this stuff yourself, um, but let's have a look at it and uh, we'll go from there. So. Right, here we go. So, like I said, this is Pulse, um, this piece of Sega software. I'm just going to run through some of it. Um, I think some of this stuff is uh, important to know about, even if you, you, know, you don't have access to, to, to Pulse. Some of this stuff could be really great to even just get a few, a few thoughts moving, I think. So, um, so can we all see that? Right? So, so what it's showing us here is, uh, is month by month trends. So we've got our, our income, our cost of sales, and what our gross profit is. Um, so gross profit is, is our profit after direct costs of doing a job. Uh, it's going to show what our percent is, what our ongoing expenses are, so that's like our overheads, um, and then what our net, net profit is at the bottom of that. So we can see, you know, if, if we're looking at this um, sort of with, a, with an independent eye, we can see we're sort of turning over about 100 grand a month. Um, up in May, we've suddenly got a big spike of 140 grand, um, and then towards sort of July, August, September, we start to then to then creep up with a bit of income. Our cost of sales sort of sit around 40, 50, 30, 40. You know, the the, the relatively steady. Um, again, you can see a big peak in in April, um, and you can see the expenses are, are relatively consistent as well. 
Um, but we've also got the profitability, so you can see profitability runs at about sort of 20 odds, high 20s. There's a big loss in April, big profit in May, and then it runs out again. I think for non financially minded people, some of this stuff can be quite difficult to interpret. That's why what we do is we like to present it in a really graphical format. Um, and I think once you start getting your head around these, it, it can make things a lot easier. So we've got operating profit. So um, blue is last year, yellow is this year. So you can see uh, moving up, look at the yellow, you can see we make a big loss in April, but then a massive profit in, in May. So you'd think, well actually, hold on, it's just a case of some income landed the month after. You know, so it's just trying to highlight things. So straight away when you see that, you think, oh no, what's, what's happened there? Um, but it's all right. Similar sort of thing here, we've got year on year revenue, so we can see a, a, a big peak. You know, so, so this might be really helpful for you know, trying to understand um, the times that are going to be really busy, you know, what's going to be your, your best month. So you can start building up trends within your business and then you know, well actually, uh, May is always mega busy, we always get some big jobs landed in May, we'll make sure we're prepared for it, you know, if you need a couple of subcontracts on hand so we can go up and work for it. You know, uh, so ju just making sure that you know if, if you know that it's going to come with a lot of cost, make sure you've got some extra cash reserves there to carry you through it. Um, again, not net operating profits, it's the same, just in a slightly different format. Um, and I think this stuff's really important just to help people interpret their figures because you know, a page of, of numbers means nothing to some people, whereas those graphs will mean everything, you know. So, for those people who are Ultimately, going back to why are we in business? Why are we in business? We're in business because we want to run a successful business that allows us time off, that allows us holidays, that makes us loads of money. Getting your focus on these key numbers is where a business leader should be operating. And obviously, you've got to start somewhere, and you know you've got to build up. And when you set up on your own, and you're just on your own, you've got you've got to get the income through the door. But this has to be ultimately where your aim is. is if you're wanting to build a team. You have to get good at running the business. Running the business involves having a good overview, which is what this provides. So um, you know you can it, it'll provide you with stuff like uh, you know month on month. How are you in month on month? So you know August income compared in 2017 compared to 2018, we're up nine grand, up nine percent. Just having a look at these and, and understanding and asking questions can be really really helpful and insightful. Um, you know, we've got the sales versus the cost. So when we were looking before at those numbers, we, we've spotted the numbers, but really here on this graph here, it becomes really obvious that the costs go up there and the income goes up the month after. So we can see what, where things are sitting. Um, this gives us our cash flow. Um, so it's quite straightforward. That one is just sort of one transaction. Um, and again, it's, it's just some examples of some reports. Again, just to give you a flavour of the sort of thing that that our clients are doing that they find really, really valuable. And once we've shown this to our clients, it becomes a really critical part of their business. Um, you know, the, the, the business owners, the people who are running the business, the managing partners, things like that. Once they've got this, this is what they rely on to run the business. If they're not going around running really asking this manager that and this manager that, they just log on here. So this information that we're looking at here is uh, currently all financial information. So we're looking at the detail that's been pulled through from zero QuickBooks, automatically into the software, and that's your final, the financial information. This information doesn't have to be financial. So we talked about measuring your leads, how many leads are you getting a week, a month, what's your conversion rate, you know, uh, how often is a customer spending with you. If you can track all this information, you can put it all into here. So you can have dashboards that present all the bits of, an inf of your business that is important for you to be able to see. Anything that can be tracked can be imported in really easily. Um, so it, it's just about having that, that, that real clear vision on where your business is at, what's working, what's not working, things like that. You know what I really like about that is, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, um, uh, when I used to work in really large construction consultants like um, Sweet Group, as it was, you see now coming around. Um, and Waterman's, we used to do this all the time. And so you're making this accessible to, you know, you know the smaller end of the, the market, which is brilliant because they need to understand, they need to, under, they need to think big and understand big to, to, to grow. 
without it. So the more they can understand where they're heading, the more you can un you, you you understand in depth of the f what the figures actually mean. So that's really really good. I think, I think you're absolutely right, William. And I think ultimately, you know, the things that big businesses do, in the most part, um, you know. The, they do them because they're tried, they're tested, they're effective and they work. But small businesses take a long time to get there because, you know, there's all the firefighting and, you know, there's all the people to manage and all these things that are constantly coming in. But, but it, like I say, it's not difficult. It is really accessible to have this information. And once, once you get it and you start putting into place big business practice, again, going back to it, it allows that scalability, it allows that growth, you know, it's just, having effective systems in place means actually that's one thing that now takes care of itself. I just need no view, great, I've got no view. I'll crack on with the strategic side of our business and where we're going and you know, going out and seeing customers or whatever it is that as, as, as a business leader you, you want to be out there doing. I think it enables them to be more professional. I think one of the things with the trades is to try and get by in a wing and a prayer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and some of the stuff we talk about is becoming getting more professional they're more organised. Mm -hmm. This is it. With, without having to spend big money, yeah. you, you don't need to spend big money to, to, to look and be more professional. And also, without having to be an accountant to understand it as well. I mean, yeah. there's nothing that anybody, with a little bit of looking at it and figuring it out, can understand. And, and you, you need to be able to understand those numbers, otherwise, you can't do it. So, you say with a guy with a lot of cash, if you don't know how much money you're making, you're not going to make any money. That's right. Simple yeah, as that. And you see, one of the, one, one of the issues I come across all the time is, and this is interesting with the quote, right? Because I was, I've been, I've been, been working with another company who had a quote, and he, and he sort of just picked up a job over in Leeds. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He said, yeah, I kind of quoted for it nine months ago, and they've come back. And I said, you reissued the quote, haven't you, with a question? No. Right. Well, at two and a half percent, two and a half percent inflation or whatever yeah, yeah, it is, yeah, exactly. for exactly. money, any profit you've got is just gone. Yeah. Oh, I'm just talking about like that. I said, and have you agreed to do it at that price? Yes. Oh, you have to put yeah. that yeah. So, and then, of course, what happens is the don't can it then, of course, he's having to nip to the merchants. I said, why are you nipping to the merchants? Well, if you've costed that job properly, You've, you've got enough from the merchants that you don't need any extra. Where's, why are they ordering extra stuff? Oh, they've run out of this, they've run out of that. But, but they should have done what they've done with it. And it's like all of a sudden, the job's not even gone from breaking even. It's now gone in the day. Mm -hmm. And then you have the argument with the, the, actually the customer at the end, they're not made any money. This. I'm going to have to charge you a bit more, but no, you're not. Yeah, exactly. That's what's on. Yeah. That's what really, really pay. fixed price. Then, don't Absolutely, yeah. Without you, variation. You, you, There's you, no variation. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, so this, just going back to what you said earlier, John. If if on on um, license zero, you've done the quote, can you put a time when that quote will be expired? Yeah. So you, so you can do that, so, so, there's, so there's no reason that you mm. couldn't say, well, actually that quote is only viable for 60 days or something. Mm. And if you come back after that, then we'll reprice it. Because I think that's the big thing. The big mm. thing is that yeah. they, they, they stick by the quote. And there's no way you should be doing that. You know, and it's like, it's like and I just shake my head sometimes at some of the stuff that goes on. And then they wonder why they don't know if they made money or not. And they don't understand about overhead either. Like they'll they'll quote for a job, and they I know my direct cost, no materials and my labour. But what about all all your all your indirect costs? Yeah. You know your accounting, your, your this that and the other. You know you're never going to make any money yeah. if you're not covering all those costs Absolutely. as well. Yeah, it's so, all it's all the it's all the it's all the hidden office costs that takes you to do <coughs> it. Plus it's stuff like and this was a prize example plaster up. Doing a job, nice little job on on a on a, it's a small housing development. Put the coat in, and then suddenly what happened was um, there was no electricity up that end of the site, there was no water. And how did we get the stuff up there? Mm -hmm. So time's coming off the job because they're having to mess around with generators. They can only work certain times when nobody else is using the generator around the site. They've got to go and get water, which is taking time. The site manager's on the back saying, well, "Why is this job not?" Well, why, why is this job not on, on, on program? Mm. And it's stuff that because you did a crap pre-start site survey. Mm. 
and it all goes back to the start. But, but what do you do at the start? I mean, you've done a good site survey. I know we don't, you know, we don't all wear our trousers. It's a customer service as well. Oh, it's it's a customer service. Yeah. So then it's, it's, you know, no one's happy. Yeah. You are getting paid yeah. the, That's right. the customer's not happy because you're either delaying things or, or you're trying to charge extra. And I think, you know, you're right, a lot of it comes down to site survey, but again, a lot of it, I think, comes down to ongoing communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I had um, a builder come do some work uh, for us, and the communication wasn't great, and we sort of, there was a few bits that happened, and we asked for a bit, but there was no extra communication yeah. throughout. It was just, everything's fine, everything's fine, everything's fine. At the end, then come back with, a, with an increased bill. It's like, well, hold well, on. You know, if, if you'd said it throughout, I would have been, yeah, I agree, yeah, I agree, yeah, I agree. But then at the end, you just whack on an extra bit. Yeah. You know, why not just talk about it throughout? And I think people shy away from talking about price far too often. Yeah. And ultimately, the easiest way to do it is just to be up front and talk about it. Because if you're up front and talk about it, you know, if you said to me, yeah, we can do that, but it'll cost an extra so much, then it's my choice to either go, yes, yeah. I do want to pay it. Because it is a variation. Huh? Yes, I do want to do it. <laughs> or, or no, I don't want to pay that extra, in which case it wouldn't happen and then I wouldn't have had to pay for it. You know, and ultimately I would have still gone for it all, but I would have been happy with the customer experience. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Dave, you can't speak about that. I'm a book in trade. <laughs> Rock into um, So I also want to have a look at, um, there's a couple of other elements to this. So obviously we talked about some reporting, which is focusing on, on some key areas. There is also a really good forecasting. So. This is coming back to what we we're talking about, what you've just sort of talked about then as well is, you know, in order to be able to get the end figure that you want, you've got to factor in your taxes, you've got to factor in your own rents, then you've got to work back to, you, to the margins that you're making on jobs. Then you link that to your forecast and your budgets for the year. You know, you know without fail what your rent is going to be every month because you've agreed a lease. You know probably without fail what your accounts bill is going to be because you'll agree to fee up front or you know, we've got all these fixed costs that we know about, so we can factor them all in, and then we get a really clear forecast and budget for the year. Um, and, 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 and Pulse allows you to keep a really good focus on that, and also then start playing with dynamic forecasts. So really quickly, I'm gonna um, just have a look at a couple. So for example, this forecast for 18, 19 is based on the figures from last year. Well, let's say, based on what we said earlier, uh, we, we were reserved earlier. So I'm going to say this year I want our income forecast to be our income from last year times times 1.05. So that's a 5% increase on our sales from last year. So if we drive really hard, we could probably get our sales up by 5% compared to last year. It will then just recalculate all those figures for you, add 5% on all your figures from last year and then give you a new forecast. So if you did achieve that 5% growth that you're looking for, that profit figure is going to have gone up to uh, that profit figure is now gone up to around 30,000. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And that's because we haven't affected the costs yet. Because if we increase our, our sales by 5%, our costs are probably also going to change. Now, with something like that, what we can do is we say actually, normally on our jobs, our materials are normally about 35% of our sales cost. So whatever we charge out of sales, our materials are about 35% of that sales. So we can add in what our, uh, what our income is, and we can do that income, and then 35% of that income. If we save that, it'll now then again update it all and give us a really dynamic forecast of saying, if your income goes up by 5%, and your material costs are 35% of your income, this is now the sort of profit that you're going to be making. So again, you can see it's actually more around sort of 30, 30 odd K. Well, last year we were on about tw tw high 20s. So if we can increase our sales by 5%, our profit will increase by about two grand a month, which is 24 grand a year. Happy days, we all be happy with that. So by a 5% increase in workload, we've got an extra 24 grand. But the reason that I think this is, you know, it's really effective it's just to give people that clarity. You know, you can play on worst case scenario. You know, what happens if we if we lose that really big contract? You know, that, that customer that is beans all that to us. What if we took that out? What would that do to our business? You know, how much more business would we have to win back to break even or 
I'll get to the profit figure that we're looking for. You know, what happens if we win an extra big contract and we've got to take on a lot of extra cost? You know, what, what effect is that going to have? And, and, and it also then also feeds into uh, a cash flow as well. Um, so you can have a, a, a really clear business cash flow. So we can see what the bank account is going to do based on the figures that we've got. I mean, obviously this is a very healthy business, uh, and, and if it did that, we'd we all be able to know. Um, the, you know, but, but having that really clear cash flow forecast so that businesses know exactly where they're at, you know, especially if you're winning big jobs with big contractors, going to be on 60, 90 day terms, can you fund yourself to get to them? I've known clients in the past where, you know, they've, they've been new to business, they've raised their head, they haven't sort of stopped, they've just been charging forwards, they've done more and more and more work, they've took on all this work and, and they've popped, they've gone too big, too quick, they don't have the systems in place, the facilities in place, they're winning all these massive contracts, but the lads won't pay every week, you know. They're not getting paid for 90 days, it, it, you know, it, it happens. So having a really clear vision on your cash flow forecast means you can plan for that. You know, we had a um, client that we were working with doing the cash flow forecasts. They could see six weeks in advance, I'm going to run out of money in six weeks. They went to the bank and said, bank manager, look here, I run out of money in six weeks. They went, wow, you really are on, on top of the ball. We'll give you an overdraft. He'd arranged the overdraft six weeks in advance of when he was going to run out of money. And the bank didn't, didn't even bat an eyelid because they could see how switched on it was to his finances, they knew it was switched on, you could see when it was going to come back out of negative cash flow. And they went, yeah, of course we'll give you a 10 grand overdraft. That was no problem. You know, so, so not only is this good for your own business management, but when it comes to getting finance, it's really effective. So it's just a really powerful tool. Um, and it was interesting because last week, the, the, the Barnsley one, we talked about contracts yeah. and understanding your contract. And actually, if you don't understand the contract, you wouldn't understand the impact on your cash flow. Right. So, and when I'm going to get paid, and it just, <coughs> it's a rolling stone that just keeps on. You wouldn't believe some of the tricks that some of the big contractors can. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Pay, yeah. Comply. We, we had a really big one, and con my contract and walked out on the job in the end because one, it was a JV, one, it was a really big job. It was. It was going to be big money for me as well, but we all agreed to walk away from it because it was going to cost him a load of money. Because mm -hmm. <coughs> one principal contractor said, Yeah, oh, yeah, it's our payment terms, 30 days, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't, it was other contractors' payment terms, 120 days at the end of a block of work. Yeah. So you might not get paid for four or five months. Mm -hmm. hey, so we've got enough work, we, can, we, we don't need that. Yeah, and they couldn't, didn't they? Yeah. And they they had all, I know they had all the sorts of trouble trying to find something to yeah. say the place. Yeah. Well, a famous example, Carillion. Carillion's payment terms were 120 days. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then an extra 60 if they could get away with it. Yeah. Wait for 120 days, then query the invoice. Yeah. So yeah. we've got a query on the invoice. Yeah. Yeah. Wait 120 exactly. days. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, these big contractors, they don't have 120 20 day payment terms with their client, no. like the MOD or, or, or the NHS, or whatever, it's 30 days. You know, and if you understand that and, and, and you demand a back to back payment agreement, they have to run around. You know, you, you, so you don't sign up to that. I mean, we say, well, no, 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 we're not doing that. Oh, no, your client will be 30 days, so we want 30 days. And if you understand the. In, the, 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 the acumen behind that, and I'm, all, cause I'm always telling small contractors, this is the sort of thing you need to know about, otherwise you, you, you know. And then you come into the fear factor, don't you, because if I demand 30 days, then I don't know what to work with me again. Yeah, and but it's not that too. I'm more work and it's, uh, it's rubbish. Yeah, it is rubbish, it's because really. I had a contract with Alpha B team, they were they'd going on 120 days, I said, don't, I said, I'm not having any of that. I said, you want me to work on government contracts. I know you're on 30 day payment terms. So, and my payment terms are 30 days. If you want me to work with you, it's 30 days. I said, I am a one man band. I've got to pay my mortgage, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so you will pay it. Yeah. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> you know. We had um, uh, a client who used to work with a couple of big contractors and, and they got fed up with 120 day payment yeah. terms. And they turned around and said, you know what, you know what, Sodja, we're not working anymore. Both contracts turn around, no, 
you can't leave. You can't leave. We'll pay her. We'll pay her. We'll pay her tomorrow. Exactly. We'll pay her. You know, they were desperate to keep them on. Yeah. We were too alert. Our clients, you know, they're like, exactly. no, they don't care anymore. They were, they were desperately begging them to work from. And, and quite often, the, the small companies don't realise how much the big contractors rely on small companies. Yeah. And no, they do because take, it's just takes having the balls. The big, yeah. the big principal contractors are only management contractors. They're people. They have. There is nothing of substance in them. And, and, and a lot of people don't seem to understand this. It's not like, say, for example, let's say I've got an empty bay who, 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 yes, they're MD contractors, and they've got, uh, you know, they'll hire their own cabin to <coughs> all this sort of stuff, and, and they've got big material costs. But they also use a lot of subcontractors to, to do things like data cabling, the, the, the um, audio visual, the, the, all these other specialist things they'll get, they'll get somebody to do, another subcontractor. And, and the bigger principal contractors, all they have, all they do is hire cabins to put their staff in and then manage the contract. They mm. don't actually have, they, they don't have people on site that actually do the trade. No, they they, they all, it's, yeah. everything is subbed out. No, nobody, none of these bigger contractors anymore actually get their hands dirty. No, they go down to, they go down to, imagine the site, and everything else. And I was at a networking event in, in, in Leeds with, uh, well, I sat at the table when they made contractors there, and there was a subcontractor who said, I've applied to, to go on your um, to, to supplier list. And, and, you know, I'm not happy because I'd applied to it, paid the fee. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, right. paid the fee. And then he went, oh no, no, we're not going to work on it. And I never had any work out of it. Yeah. And he said, and I ran up to be told that oh, you had to complete the application form correctly. Not to run back and say, by the way, no. by the way, you know this is wrong, right? And here's a chance to put it right. And then we pocketed the cash into us. It's screwed up. And I actually said to this main contractor, what would you do if these, these subcontractors around here said they didn't want to work for you? And they look on their face and say, what are you trying to do? Yeah. What would you say? You'd be not yeah, yeah. And they go, well, 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 yeah, yeah, we would. I said, so you need to treat them. Don't be a silly basher. Exactly. You treat them right. All, right. all the directors talk about, oh, we look after our subcontractors. And, we're, we're, we're. and when you get, which is fine, hmm. but when you get to contract management level, there is zero respect yeah. and 100% can a bullying. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I'm, 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 I get really I know I mean, it, I know it's, not, it, it's sort of off topic as well, but when you look at things like PQQs as well, it's the same, you know. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but. All right, back to John. Sorry, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just really quickly again, just, just on last bit on Paul, is, um, is, is sort of giving you those KPIs. We talk about KPIs, I, I love having a dashboard overview. So, for our clients, a lot of them will have the most important numbers set up in here. So, you know, your cash flow forecast, what's happening, you know, you can see the payment for the receipts, you know, what the, what the cash is doing, you know, you can see the cash went down in that month, but most months it's going up to the bank account, keeps going up, things like that. That was really important to one of our clients, so they've got a, a board that tells them that. We've got the gross profit margin percent, you know, so you can see uh, this month here, the gross profit was, was massive, but obviously that's because there was that big invoice the month before it was much smaller. So those things can be set up completely customised for our businesses. Um, okay, so that's Pulse. Um, so for me, I just want to sort of finish up, I think, for just a, a final point. People might be happy to share, people might not be. Um, but it's almost like, what's your hourly rate? Think of your end, what's your hourly rate? Um, still lots of people aren't using stuff like Zero and QuickBooks. And I understand that there is an argument between who, whether you're time rich or whether you're cash rich or time poor or cash poor. Um, and it's obviously got to be bearing in mind. But if you think about what your hourly rate is, we moved one of our clients from Sage to Zero, to from desktop Sage to, to Zero. And they came back and said that they save five hours a week. So five hours a week is 20, pounds a, uh, 20 hours a month. 20 hours every single month they save. 
And they saved that by paying £22 to zero to have their software. So if you figure that out, that's an hourly rate of £1.10 an hour. I don't think I know of anyone that would be working for £1.10 an hour. Mm -hmm. Get people not embracing technology and still using old systems that are inefficient, that don't have automation, are effectively costing themselves a lot more money. That five hours a week can be spent doing all sorts of awesome stuff. Or you know what? Can be spent not working. You know, either way, they've got five hours to not work and enjoy life, or they've got five hours to actually earn some money rather than slaving away for an effective rate of one pound ten an hour. Um, and again, you know, we're talking about bookkeeping. There's loads. You know, obviously, I'm coming at this from a from from a software point of view. There is loads of bits of software that can improve process. So there is always software developing. The software is developing so quickly now. You know, people resist change. Do not resist change. You know, human humans as a as a species have been changing forever and will keep changing forever. Um, you, you can't stand still. If you stand still, you're going backwards. Mm. Um, so again, why are you in business? Yeah. And just, just have a look at your current processes and systems. You know, one of the common things that I'm sure you've all heard before, why is it you're doing it that way? Oh, because that's how we've always done it. That is the worst answer. And, and I was actually uh, a, 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 client, a client of ours um, was working on, on some, some processes, some KPIs that they had in place. And they had this sheet that they had to fill in every single week. And they filled in this sheet every week. And every week there was this, there was this box with a zero in. So I'm like, what's this zero? And they couldn't figure it out. And, and so they sort of were asking around. No one sort of knew what this zero was that got put in this box every week. But they knew they had to put a zero in this box. And, and so they passed it on. And, and they were looking through the archives. And they finally found a really old copy of this form that they were still filling in. Yeah? And they pulled it out. And it was zero air strikes this week. <laughs> zero air strikes this week. We're still filling this in now. Yeah? From the war, something had carried on. Right? And so I suppose the, the, the moral of the story is constantly be looking at improving systems. You know, there is always scope to improve. I haven't met a perfect business yet. And um, I, I think just keep improving. So, um, if anyone wants a one-to-one -one software demo, I'm always happy to offer one-to-one -one software demos. If anyone wants to put their numbers into Pulse, again, it automatically links to QuickBooks, it automatically links to zero, but you can take your figures from elsewhere. We can put your figures into Pulse, so if you want to get a feel of how Pulse looks on your business, that would be fine. Um, we're also running a lot of seminars, um, so if anyone wants to come on to any of our free seminars, obviously more than welcome. Could you email us? Details of the free session. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Yeah